announcement just as we begin. Um, as I mentioned this morning, the ladies will be having the, their planning session this coming Saturday, and that'll be at 9 o'clock. And, um, and there's going to be a breakfast. So take care of you there. Make sure you're fed. So, um, so anyways, so keep that in mind again this coming Saturday at 9. And um, look forward to that. Um, all right. Well, let's open a word of prayer as we begin this evening. Father, we just come before you and thank you so much, Father, for the day that you've already given to us and just uh, being able to study your word even this morning and the Sunday school hour. And I pray that you just speak to us once again, your Father, tonight and through the songs that we'll sing and through the uh, message, your Father, and through your word ultimately as we share it and, and as we heed it, your Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts as only you can. And we just uh, trust in you, your Father, for, for the results. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we'll take a few favorites this evening. <coughs> Let's see. 250? Okay. All right, page number 250. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We'll sing all three on this one.
243. Page 243, Victory in Jesus. chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at uh, verses 57 down through verse 62 in the text. And the title of the message this evening is, Do We Have a Me First or Others First Mentality? Do we have a Me First or Others First Mentality? And just a couple of different thoughts here, just an introduction. Uh, Christ went about his earthly ministry, people either wanted to follow him, or were invited by him, yet some desire to do so uh, on their own terms. And we're going to be looking at this, and notice here in Luke chapter 9, and beginning in verse 57, 
And here it says, and, and I don't know about in your Bible, but in mine, it's the, the title of this, this part of the text is, it's called The Cost of Discipleship, which I think is exactly fit. And so here it says in verse 57, again, Luke chapter 9, beginning verse 57, it says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And notice what Jesus' response was here. He says, And Jesus said to him, Foxes and holes and birds of the air have nests, and but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then 59, it says, Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And you stop and think about those verses and say, man, you know, what a, you know, what is wrong with Christ here? And he seems very harsh in a sense. Because when you stop and think about what's going on here in the text, and here's you say, well, I mean, especially even today, it seems very hard to find anyone that's going to say, hey, I'm willing to follow you, period. And here, and you can imagine back, and, and that's because, and that's with uh, most of America anyway, having at least heard of Christ, they know who Jesus Christ is. Whether they're following or not, it's a whole different story. But here, as we think about this text, here's Christ just starting out on his ministry. So really, by and large, no one had heard of him unless they had already seen his miracles and seen what he had done um, in the various cities beforehand, before they got to them. And of course, word would spread. Uh, they didn't have internet and, and the news and everything else like we do today. But they would at least be able to hear, you know, hey, this, this is Jesus Christ coming to town. And so here, and we also don't know what the motives of these individuals were. And those that we, we would tend to think that, you know, they had the best of motives. But stop and think about what they're stating, and, and it doesn't seem anything really out of the ordinary. And again, verse 58, it says, in, uh, or 57 rather, it says, now, when it had, now it happened as they journeyed on the road, and someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And he doesn't even have an excuse. But what is Christ's response? He says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so, once again, he's saying, hey, if you're going to follow me, it's not an easy road. He goes on in, in verse 59, the next one, he says to me, follow me. And then he says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And this one may be even the hardest one to kind of swallow in a sense. Because, I mean, who's not going to let them go and bury their father? But what's his response? What's Christ's response? He says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And the next one says, and another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell over at my house. It's family. You know, who's not going to let them, you know, go and at least bear, or at least go and bid farewell to the family? And what's Christ's response? He says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And if you remember a few weeks back, it's probably been about maybe a month or so back, um, we were talking about the disciples and we had mentioned the, the this type of aspect there and on a Sunday morning. And we had made the comment that, which really struck me whenever he was... Um, Whenever he was calling the sons of Zebedee out, it says that they left Zebedee, their father, in the boat. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. I mean, here they are out fishing, and Christ says, follow me. They followed him and left their dad in the boat. So that will show you how much 
that they were wanting and willing to follow Jesus Christ. And you say, well, that's that seems very harsh. You know, I mean, you don't you just leave them, and I mean, doesn't say how old the, the dad is, whether he's going to be able to get along in life, whatever the case may be. And yet here, we, the whole point of this is not to show how hard nosed that Jesus Christ is, but it's but it's really begging the question of where, what is, where is our priorities in our lives? Is the Lord truly the Lord of our lives? And also with that in mind, is he really going to take care of us? Do we really have the faith and the trust and the confidence that we say we do, whatever it really comes down to it? And even here, um, and I think it's very interesting there in that verse 62, his response, no one having put his hand uh, to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, Dad has, uh, down in his office, down in, at, his, at his church there in Georgia, he's had this picture uh, ever since I can remember, even as a little boy, uh, whenever he was starting a church, he had a little office of sorts in, in um his bedroom, and he always had this picture of of a uh, farmer, and basically plowing along, just looking straight ahead, and and underneath it, he had had somebody um, burn into wood. It was like a, a little placard with this verse, and I always thought about that, and uh, that was his motivation that whatever he was doing, that was for the Lord. And basically, as this verse says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So what has he called us to do? And then what is our response? And as the title again of the message, do we have a me first or others first mentality? And so here we would say that, you know, say, well, I don't know that this is necessarily others first or me first necessarily. But, you know, I was thinking about it this week uh, and it really just started to dawn on me. And, and actually, I wanted to. Maybe, maybe you might want to do the same thing. But I want to just start paying more attention, at least in my life, it's just as far as how that we are very selfish. And I think we would be genuinely surprised as we stop and think about that. And, and, and I would say that as Christians, we're probably less selfish, obviously, than the world. But like anything else, you look at even Lot, Lot in the Old Testament, um, he thought that, and they called him just Lot. And yet, he, we know how much that Sodom had, had uh, really affected him and his spiritual life. And really, I think at times it's important for us to be able to pause and ask the question, how much is the world really um, entering into my heart? And how much is it changing me? So... And here I thought, you know, for the new year as we start off on this Sunday evening is, is this aspect in this, in this really the reality of having a other's first mentality. And so here as we look into this text also, we see first of all that um, this me first mentality was fundamentally opposed to Jesus' concept of following him. He demanded that one deny himself to follow him. In this same uh, chapter, if you would look back in verse 23, still here in Luke chapter 9, um, in verse 23. And it says here, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone de desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me. For whoever, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Then he goes on and says in verse 25, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed and lost? And I think it's very interesting that this statement from Christ comes on the heels of of verse 18, where he says, And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and asked him, 
who did the crowd say, and, and, and saying, who did the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God, uh, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. Then we come into verse 23, where he says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Here, Peter, he, he jumps right on it, doesn't he? And, he? and his response was, he says, The Christ, the Son of God. This is, who he, this is who you are. And so here as we think about this thought as far as with this others first or me first, Christ has to be first and foremost in our hearts daily. And that's really what it comes down to. And, and I think it's very interesting that he used that term in there that he says daily. Because that's exactly how our relationship with him is. You can't just say, well, I came and accepted you as Lord, and now, you know, that's that's that, and, and now I go on, and, you know, what's next in my life? If you're, uh, those of you that are married, um, if you treated your girlfriend that way, you would have never got married. Um, and and, and that's, that's genuinely true in any type of relationship, not only just a, a husband-wife relationship, any kind of relationship, or even friendship. How does a friendship develop? Getting to know the other individual. Uh, and you can't say that you know Jesus Christ or a Christian, a Christ-like one, if, you're, if it's basically just a hit or miss. We don't even know Jesus Christ if that's the type of relationship that we supposedly have with him. So here he demanded also that we deny ourselves to follow him. And we see that here in verse 23. Also, back in Luke chapter 14, just a few pages forward, in Luke chapter 14, he required that one hate even his own life also. Luke chapter 14, notice verse 26 here in the, in the text. He begins at verse 25 and says, uh, and again, Luke chapter 14, verse 25, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, uh, brothers and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's quite the statement, isn't it? Yeah. And can you imagine, once again, I mean, here, and it seems, and just from the text, it says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, and you say, well, that's not, you know, a very good way of uh, winning friends and influencing people. Making these types of statements. But that wasn't his agenda. His agenda was to produce true followers. And he makes this statement, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father. And you say, well, is that what he's really asking? Does he want me to hate my mother and father? And then he goes on and says, a wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yea, in my own life also. Is he truly asking us to hate these individuals? And the answer is not in the way that we're looking at it. The hate here is in relationship to our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It should appear that we hate everyone else in relation. Are we genuinely hating them? No, absolutely not. Christ is not calling us to hate people. How are we going to win them? But the whole thought is, is in our relationship, and, if you, and we won't get into the whole semantics of it, but the thought of the word love, agape, is the strongest form of love. And that's what Christ has for us. We have no idea. We know how to spell the word, but as far as living that out, really in the end, we really don't have a clue. I really genuinely believe as to know how to genuinely agape love someone else. As Christ loved us. You say, well, why? How can you say that? Would you have died for you if you were God? Probably not. But yet here we see in this, and this is what he's calling us to, 
And, and this, I mean, you talk about blowing your right out of your socks. I mean, to make this type of statement, and it just, and, it, and it's, it's as if he just turns around and talks to the, to the crowd, and this is what comes out of his mouth. Quite the statement. But yet, we also have to understand who's he talking to. He's not necessarily questioning the disciples already, but although we've already read how that he addresses almost the same type of thought, but he goes and he's addressing these multitudes. You also have to understand why, why are they following him? Probably for a bevy of different reasons. They're not just following because they really genuinely are following after him as the disciples were following after him. They were following him because it was basically the Barnum and Bailey circus of the time. Mm -hmm. They were following because who else could do these types of miracles? If you could go and turn water into wine and heal sick people and raise the dead, you're going to draw a following. Uh -huh. But the thought of it is here is he, he's saying, hey, if you're genuinely wanting to follow after me, there's some things you're going to have to give up. And there's going to be some things that are going to seem like you hate. Individuals, it's going to seem like you hate them to follow after me. And so here we see that he required that one hate his own life also. And so once again, as we're thinking, and, and again, we're bringing back to this main thought of do we have a me first or others first mentality? This fits right in line with that. Because if we have just a selfish mentality of loving myself and not really thinking of our neighbor, then this is really, this, these verses are really for us. And we need to apply these to our own lives. Living in a culture that praises putting self first and then looking out for number one, it is easy for Christians to adopt this me first mentality. But consider some ways we can be guilty of this. And we think about this, even in uh, we would say, and I'm not going to be ragging, I know we're, there's people that are not here for different reasons, I understand that. But we stop and think about church attendance. Um, and I, I've been talking to a few different other pastor friends of mine just over the course of the last couple of months. And um, even Micah, my brother-in-law, Christmas time we were talking. And their church is a, was a, is a bigger church, they have a big Christian school. And their church attendance is really down. And, and it just seems to be the national trend, in a sense. Um, and for, and I'm sure there's a bevy of reasons. Um, but you stop and think about this, and, and we would hope that this is not one of them. But as we're thinking about this me first, you know, some people, church is just something that is basically, it's a hit or miss. It's not really that important to them. It, it, it's, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me how many people, you know, they, they, they don't think twice about going to a football game or going to this or that, but they do not have time for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about it all. <laughs> yeah. And yet they still say that they're Christians. They're still followers of Christ. There's nothing wrong with football, trust me. Um, you know, we want uh, at my team, our, our family's really divided. Uh, three different teams in one house. Not good. Um, but anyway, with that said, uh, we all, and there's nothing wrong with football. There's a lot of different things. We can name, we can sit here all night and think of different things. There's not a, in and of, of themselves wrong with it. But as we mentioned this morning, what is it that has our hearts, though? If that's, if that's taking time over the Lord, that's really an idol. Uh, the Bible says that, and Christ says that, that idols are to be torn out of our hearts, ripped out of our hearts. And he, he demands to be number one in our lives. And rightfully so, he created us. Uh, he made us. He saved us. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we give him everything? And yet, we will often put personal interests before opportunities. To change service, I just wrote down a few different things. Recreational outings, family gatherings, 
um, uh, work, and I understand, I put work, but I, I put an asterisk for that. I understand there's times whenever people can't help that with work. Um, or school-related activities, even at times. And staying home just to read or watch TV. Uh, I know we're putting our services on uh, on Facebook and out on the internet. I appreciate appreciate John's willingness and help with that. Uh, that doesn't mean you can just stay home. Forget not the assembling of ourselves together, unless you can help it. Um, and so we think about that. We also think about a couple other different thoughts along that line. Is in our service to one another, not necessarily just coming to these services, but also our service to one another. God has blessed each one of us with gifts and talents to serve one another. What are we doing with them? Everyone, and you say, well, I don't know. I don't even know what my spiritual gift is. And um, for some of you, probably not a good thing. Um, we'll get into that. Uh, but the Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And let's look at verse 3 through verse 8. And talking about here in our service to others. And you think about, and, and we make the comment very often that Jesus Christ never asked us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. And especially in this aspect of service, Jesus was the ultimate Example of a servant leader, and and, uh, and I don't think any of us would dispute that. So here, as we're thinking about this aspect, God has blessed each one of us with gifts to serve one another. Romans chapter twelve. Notice in verse beginning in verse three, down through verse eight, and it says, "For I say through the grace given to me." Paul's talking here to the church of Rome. He says, "For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you." Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So no matter what your gifts are, and this is not an exhaustive amount of gifts that are it's really presented, but here, even in our gifts that the Lord gives to us to be able to serve Him, even in all of these different verses, I think it's very interesting there in verse 4 where it says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually individually members of one another. And I, and you say, well, what, what, what are we talking about? And I think it was a blessing yesterday with all the individuals that showed up, uh, that came out to be able to help take down just even as simple a thing as Christian, Christmas decorations. That's a blessing. You know, and, and the thought of it is, is, it doesn't matter what it is that we're doing, and we know ultimately what we're doing is for Christ. This is his church. We should all be involved. And so once again, here is, as he's, and this is exactly what he's talking about. No matter what our gifts are, there may not be a lot of different things that we can maybe, some of you can do. And there's a lot of people that aren't here because they can't do but so much anymore. But the thought of it is, is that, that there's still things we can do. We can pray, we can uh, call, we can send letters or cards, and there's all kinds of things we can do to encourage the body in Christ. So here in our service to one another, also along with this thought of service to one another, look in 1 Peter, just a few books over. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 
And notice in verse 10 and 11, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 and 11. And, and actually, let's back up. Let's back up to verse 7 in this text. Give you a little more of the uh, background. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love, one, uh, love for one another. And I think it's very interesting here where he says, but, at, but the end of all things is at hand. This is back in 1 Peter. Think about today. How much closer we are to the end. And then how much more, how much closer that we should be towards one another. And he goes on and says, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. That's an amazing statement when you stop and think about it. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Not just flippant. You know, not, well, it's the time of day to read my Bible and pray. If that's the attitude we have, you might as well go find something else to do. Because he says, be serious and watchful in our prayers. And I think it's very interesting there that serious, in, and if you, if you study that out, the seriousness there. Is being able to 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 realize that the what you're praying, who you're talking to, you're talking to the Lord of Lords, the seriousness of it, and then whenever we bring prayer requests up, realizing that it's not just throwing them to the wind, but realizing that the prayers that we're praying is to the God of the universe that created everything we see around us, and yet He cares for each one of us as if. We were his only creation. That's an amazing thought. And he goes on and says, uh, be serious and also watchful. And in that watchfulness, it's not necessarily just being that serious soberness uh, aspect. But also I think of, about this, being watchful in as we're praying, how the Lord is answering those prayers. And I'll be honest, at times I pray for individuals, and I'm not being watchful. I'm not necessarily looking at it as I really should, and I'm being honest. Maybe watching to say, well, I wonder how the Lord is going to answer this specific request. But be watchful in that. And, and as I may mention, you know, with uh, the praise journal that I keep, it, it's, it is amazing just how the, as we... Really stop and think about it, not just the big, huge things that we pray about, but even in the little, minuscule things of life, how the Lord answers prayer. And that's the blessing of it, is to be able to be watchful and seeing how the Lord is going to work in those prayers and work through them for His glory. And so once again, He says, be uh, uh, serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, going back to the same thought of the gifts, uh, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belong the glory, who, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So as we're encouraging, and we should be encouraging one another towards Christ's likeness, but also in that, he's also talking about even with their gifts, encouraging. Where uh, where people excel. If you're if you're cleaning the toilet, or if you're Larry does a great job at cooking, and and uh, the ladies decorating, and no matter what we're doing here, it does not matter what it is. It's all as the end of the, that portion says. It says to whom belong and to the, to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever. It's all for His glory. It's all for him. 
See, there was no glory in cleaning a toilet. Mm, maybe not much. <laughs> um, but it's all for who you're doing it for. So the thought of it is here is that even in, and actually going back to that me first, there you go. Now, do we jump in there to clean that toilet or do we think, you know, well, someone else can do it? That was a freaky, that was a new um, And so, it, so here as far as in our service to one another, these, these verses here really point to this fact. Also a couple different thoughts along this line of the service to one another. Yet many take little effort to do their part in the work of the local congregation. They do not learn the names of other members. I'm not going to name names here, but there is a few people that I've heard overheard, and they're like, well, what's your name again? And we need to learn each other's names. So that's number one. Uh, then also they do not seek to find their gift or ability God has given them. And that really shows really one main thing. That they're probably not interested in the things of the Lord. That's really what that shows. If there's no interest in even wanting to know what the gifts are that the Lord's given to you spiritually, then there's really a spiritual problem. Also, um, also we would think about this. and It's not only in their service to one another. Sometimes that's the easy one. Then there's also in our, in our family relationships. And within our families, Christians have duties to the members of their own physical families. Let's look at this just briefly. Uh, two portions of scripture. Colossians, or, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Notice beginning verse 18. Here in our family relationships, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, that is, is fitting to the Lord. And before the husbands can go and say, that's right, notice verse 19, says, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, never provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart fearing God. And so here we see mainly from verse 18 down through 21, we see within our own families the responsibilities of each one, uh, loving one another as we should. And ultimately, that it's not just to get along, but it's mainly that that love is to be able to strengthen one another towards Christ's likeness. And then as we are, it's a very, e it's, it's, it's so much easier to be able to get the picture of the love that we should have for, a Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, if you see even that, that love and that bond within a family. To be able to understand how much that the Lord loves us times infinity whenever we have that love within our family. And I understand not every family has that luxury. There's a lot of different situations that enter into that. Unfortunately, not everybody's playing their part in those verses that we mentioned. And that's unfortunate. But that's this is basically God's model for the family. And if everything's fitting and, and working and every, all the cogs are going as they should and uh, basically this is what really the family unit is supposed to look like. And we would say again, even in the family, this is where selfishness enters in. If things are not looking like this, then it's basically because one element or maybe multiple elements or individuals within that unit are not being what they should be, not only with the Lord first and foremost, but also very selfish in their relationship with one another. And that's why these things are not being played out. So here in our family, also in Ephesians, just one other uh, portion, just back up to Ephesians chapter 5. Notice in verse 22, we're going to be reading three different verses, 22, 25, and 33. Ephesians chapter 5. 
beginning in verse 22. And it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. If we say that we love Christ and we don't have love for our spouse, then something is desperately wrong. Also, we can come to verse 33, just a few verses on down. It says, um, he says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Once again, this is, this is the same type of mentality. And if and it's, it's placing, even in, in this portion of Scripture, our spouse over even ourselves and our own uh, wants and our own thoughts and and actually living it out to where they are become first in our life. And it's not the me first, but it's others first mentality. And that's what we should have. And if and, and it all starts, as we've been mentioning all along the way here, it starts with our relationship with Christ. If our relationship is with Christ is not where it should be, then the rest of our relationships, whether it's the church, whether it's our family, Friends, doesn't matter who it is, it's all going to crumble like dominoes. That's exactly how it will go. And we also are seeing, if, if you're paying attention through this, is the sense that Christ's plan is perfect. If we just follow it, if we do put others first, if we, and it's not just saying, well, man, my life's in uh, you know, atrocious, and I want my life back, and so I just need to start. It also goes back to our heart, and Christ knows that as well. So the thought of it, though, is, is that if we don't have this heart, ask God for it. You think he's going to withhold this from you? Absolutely not. But it's also going to take time and motivation on our hearts as he does that work within us. And the last thing we're just going to point out this evening is, it's not a, this, as we're seeing here, this is, how the, the, what the Lord expects, but then also we see the other's first principle as exemplified by Christ. We think about this. He came to this earth because he put others first. That was his whole motivation. We asked the question a little earlier. Would you have come to earth and, and sent, or sent your son to die for a race that totally uh, was in rebellion, open rebellion to you? Basically, even saying that you didn't exist, so I probably wouldn't. <laughs> and um, I love my kids. <laughs> I wouldn't have sent my kids to win any of my kids to die for a race like that. But you stop and think about God's love for us. While we were yet in sin, Christ died. So he came to earth because he put others first. He wants that relationship restored. We talked about that this morning. He wants that relationship restored that was lost before the fall. We also see that we are called upon to adore the uh, one another with the same mind and attitude. We're also to do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit. We're to esteem others better than ourselves. We've already read verses to this fact this, this evening. We're also to look out for the interests of others. And I, I would say that this church does a very good job of that. Um, some may fall through the cracks and not because we're trying to, just because of the nature of it. But I think this church, by and large, does a very good job of trying to keep up with the needs of others. Um, Mary was telling me this evening about Linda Griffith, and um, she's having some uh, health issues, and you know, and that's 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 what it's all about, you know, understanding the needs of others, be, be, be willing to pray for them and keep them before the Lord, and that's what it's all about. Jesus exemplified the principle principles of others first that He desires in all of us as well, and also the last thing we're just going to make mention of here in closing is. 
also this other's first principle exemplified by the Macedonians. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this will be the last text we'll look at this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and notice verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 4. And here, Paul talking to the church of Corinth, and he's talking to the Macedonians here in particular. And he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us, with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but the first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he's talking to the church of Corinth here, but he's using the church of Macedonia here as, as an example of really how the church of Corinth really should be responding and acting as a church. And notice what he says there at the very beginning. He says in verse 2, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So even through the persecution, even through everything that was going on at this point in the church of Macedonia, they were still being the church that God had called them to be. You know, you stop and think about, and, and we mentioned that even this morning by, by uh, talking about that uh, the Chinese uh, student that my dad was talking to there and his his comment there you know that the and and but but it really comes back to this reality of how much do we truly love Jesus Christ what is first and here is we in, in this text where he says that in great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality to most of us, we would think that if the church became poor, we would start, you know, start, you know, uh, huddling everything and start watching every penny and, 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 you know, well, I don't know if we can help people anymore. We've got to take care of our own and, and this and that. That was not their mentality. We mentioned last week that God's kingdom is a backwards kingdom. First should be last. Last should be first. And this is the, this is exact opposite of what we would Think would happen, the type of mentality that we would think that they would have. Why? Because it wasn't about the selfishness. It wasn't about the me first mentality. It was about others. And notice what they were doing. Once again, he says in verse 2, that in great trial of affliction, with all this going around and on, the abundance of their joy, the abundance of their joy, it wasn't necessarily just that they had joy. It was the abundance of their joy. So, well, what is wrong with them? They're going through affliction. They're going through persecution. Their joy was founded in, and rooted in Jesus Christ. So nothing was going to shake that. They genuinely loved God. Persecution brings that out. As we mentioned this morning, persecution always, if you do any kind of study, uh, through the from the New Testament all the way through the church age, God's always used persecution to be able to to basically refine and, and get the dross off of His church to be able to really show who the genuine believers are. Amen. And so here, as he as he goes on and he says that in great trial and affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality, even in their deep poverty. 
we see that they were still being very liberal in their giving to be able to help the other brothers and sisters in Christ. We also notice it says it goes on in verse 3. For I bear witness, Paul saying, I bear witness that according to their ability, which was very little, and beyond their ability, they were uh, freely willing and imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift. And here's Paul. You can imagine Paul understanding that this church has nothing really, and by and large, but they're being urgent and wanting Paul to receive this gift that they're trying to give to him, understanding that what he's doing is for the cause of Christ as well. And then Paul goes on and says, and, and Paul goes on and says, um, says in the fellow uh, to receive the gift of the fellowship of the ministry to the saints, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. If you're just reading over this text, you might you might just skip over that point. But that was first and foremost. He says, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So here, we would say this in closing as we as we end is how much do we truly love Jesus Christ in our lives? Um, and I believe that that's really going to tell the tale as far as the answer to the question of, and really the, the, uh, the title, as far as do we have a me first or others first mentality. Before we even talk about others, we have to talk about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he truly supreme in our life? And as we mentioned even in the outset of the, the various verses there, whenever, when Christ was calling the disciples to himself, it's a matter of putting your hand to the plow and not looking back. Understanding that what he's called us to, this relationship with him, yes, but also this work that he's given us to do as far as in living our lives for him. Is that everything to us? Or are we, are we, have we become selfish? Have we been vacuumed into the society of a me first uh, mentality and a selfishness? And I think it's so easy to do. Um, you know, uh, we were we were watching a game last night, and and it just it just even the commercials. It's just you know you've got to have the greatest and the latest and all these different things, and it's just constantly. Um, drawing on our nature, our selfish nature, because we, you know, oh, well, there's this and this, and, you know, and, and, and really in the end, what does it really do for us? You know, they might have the seven out now, but they're going to have the 10 out probably next year. You no, know? and, and guess what? There's going to be suckers that are going to buy that too. And it just, where does it end? So the thought of it is, is that True joy, true peace, and true contentment is only going to be found in Jesus Christ. Period. And then we ask that, and then as we ask this question, you know, as far as in the end too, where is our mentality as far as our service to others? And as we mentioned, it's not only just to the church, it's towards those outside these four walls too. And if we don't have a heart for them, and if we don't have a heart for those in here, we don't have a heart for our families, there's something desperately wrong. Something spiritually wrong. And we definitely need to seek the Lord and ask Him to do a work in our heart to rid that from our lives. We want to be able to stand before the Lord one day and hear, well done, that great and faithful, great and faithful servant. But also we would say with that, I want to be able to realize that, hey, I genuinely love the Lord. It wasn't just to, I made it through the door. But it's that I genuinely love my God. And then I also love those he's put underneath us. And he said, well, you're the pastor. Yeah, but you know, that goes for each one of us. There's people under each one of you that the Lord's, there's no accidents in this life that he's given you no matter what you're doing. People underneath you, whether it's a family or whether it's co-workers or whatever the case may be, for you to, to affect a difference spiritually in their lives as well. 
So it's not to just go through this life and this is me first mentality, but it's realizing that others have to be on our minds. Because it was the ultimate reason that Christ came to this earth. It was for you and for me. We are the others. And I pray that this has been an encouragement to you. And I know it was an encouragement to me this past week, even putting this together and, and realizing in my heart, my life, uh, as you start delving into this, you better be careful. Because he'll dig up a lot of stuff in the heart, and rightfully so. And that should be our, our goal, is to be able to get rid of the stuff that shouldn't be there. And to become more like him. Let's close a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much just for your word this evening. We thank you, Lord, Father, for these truths that we can glean. And I thank you, God, for your spirit that brings conviction into our hearts and into our lives. And I pray that as we go from here, that this would... We wouldn't forget these truths in a week. And I pray, dear Father, that these would be truths that we apply to our lives daily. Understanding, dear Father, that the love that you gave for us, we, you've also given us that love. It's reciprocal. And I pray that you'd help us to love you even more. And then, as we love you more, then as we branch out and we love those around us, more, the church, the, our, our, our families, our those outside of these walls. We pray that each one that we come in contact with, that you truly give us a love for people. And show them the love of Christ as well. That we give you the praise and the glory for it. And we look expectantly, dear Father, even to this new year, to realize how that you want to be able to use us. And so we pray, dear Father, that you help us to be 